Hello, this is Jennifer Martinez. In this video, we're going to go over orthogonal sets and projections. Let's start with an orthogonal projection. We're going to do it in R2. So what is the projection of Y onto U? Let's start with this picture. So here's Y in red, and here's U. The projection of Y onto U is usually labeled as Y hat right there. So let me do this in a different color. The projection of Y onto you is in yellow. And you can see there's a Y hat. So other notations that you might see is the projection of Y onto you. They would label it that way. Or in our book, they like to use the projection of Y onto L, where L is the span of you. So L is this whole line here in blue is the span of you. The formula for this is given below. It's y hat is equal to the dot product of your y and your u over the dot product of u with itself times, and this by the way is a scalar, so it's times that u. can see it's a little bit larger. So to find this formula, what we're going to do is decompose y into two vectors. So we have y, there's our y again, there's our y, and it's going to be y hat, which is the one that we want, the yellow, times some z. So let's call that z right there. Or the z is going to be orthogonal to my u, where y hat is equal to alpha times u. So we can see here for some alpha, right, that y hat is going to be some alpha times u. You could be larger and then y hat be smaller. But that's what we're after. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and find alpha. So I'm going to start with this formula and solve for z and plug in y hat so I get that formula. We know that z is orthogonal to u. So that means that z dot u from the last video is zero. So we're going to start with z dot u. We know it's zero. And we're going to plug in with the z's that I found up here. Distribute that through. And then just solve for alpha. Bring this over to this side. Divide both sides by this u dot u. And you have the alpha. We have the y hat. So that is the formula. So let's go ahead and do an example of this. So let's let y be 7, 6 and u be 4, 2. Find the, or the orthogonal projection of y onto u. And then we're going to write y as the sum of the two vectors, one being the span of u and one orthogonal to u. So I'll keep my formula above. So first I'm going to look for y dot u. So what is that going to be? It's the transpose of y times u, so it's just 28 plus 12, which is 40. So let's do the same thing with u dot u. That's just going to be 16 plus 4, but I wrote it out anyway, equals 20. So then we know what y hat is. y hat, which is the projection of u onto y is equal to, well we know it's y dot u over u dot u, which is a scalar, times u. So in our case it's 40 over 20 u or 2u. So let's go ahead and look at the picture again. So these values are actually here. So y is 7, 6. So no, 7, 6 is y. Here's y. u is 4, 2. So 4, 2. And then you can see that y hat is 2u. It's another u. So it does make sense. You can actually find that y since you know that u is 4, 2. It would be 8, 4. So it looks like it's 8, 4 is about right. So that is the projection of y 
onto the line or you through the origin. Either way. So that's where the second part comes in. So now it asks us to write y as a sum of two orthogonal vectors, one in the span of u, which is that line L, and one orthogonal to u. So we know from above that, we call this z again, we know that y, the vector y, is equal to our new y hat, our new vector that we just found, plus some z. We know what y hat is, so let's just find z. So z, we know, is our vector y minus our projection. We know each, so we know that this is 7, 6. We know this is 8, 4. So this would be a negative 1, 2. That's what the z is. So now we're going to write y as the y hat, which was 8, 4. Let me just write that first. y hat plus the vector z. So that's 8, 4 plus, oops, negative 1, 2. And there it is. We wrote y as the sum of two orthogonal vectors. z and y hat are orthogonal to each other. One in the span of u, one along the line L, and one orthogonal to u. And you can check to make sure they're orthogonal. So if we take y hat dotted with our z, we better get 0. And you can see here you would get negative 8, because you just multiply these together, plus the 8, which is in z, 0. So that's just a check. And there it is. Next, let's talk about orthogonal sets and the definition. Definition of a set of vectors u1 through up and rn is a orthogonal set if each pair of distinct vectors from the set is orthogonal. That is, if you take u sub i dotted with u sub j, it better be zero whenever the i is not equal to j. Let's look at an example of this with three vectors that the book did example one in the book. So we have these three vectors. It says show that this set is an orthogonal set. So I'm going to look at u1 dotted with u2. We're going to look at u, all the different combinations. u1 dotted with u3. And yep, it's indeed zero. And then u2 dotted with u3. The all three have to be zero for it to be orthogonal and an orthogonal set. Each pair of distinct vectors is orthogonal. So this is an orthogonal set. And we can see this picture that all three are orthogonal to each other. So if you have an orthogonal set, if S is an orthogonal set, we have a theorem of non-zero vectors in Rn, then S has, happens to be linearly independent and hence a basis for the subspace spanned by S. So let's look at the proof of that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to let S be the set, be an orthogonal set of non-zero vectors in Rn. To show that S is linearly independent, what I'm going to do is just look at the definition of linearly independence, show that the equation, some constant x1 uh, uh, times the fir first vector plus another constant times the second vector all the way through equals zero only has the trivial solution. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this left side and dot it with u. We know that this is 0, so no, we know 0 dotted with u is 0. And what does the left side look like? So I'm going to distribute this through, and we're going to get this equation. And these are all 0 because, by the definition of a orthogonal set, each set, as long as i is not equal to j, 
is uh, dotted together is zero. So we end up, that's where I said that, so we end up, because um, these were orthogonal, we end up with just the first term. This one is the only one that's not zero. Therefore, solving this, since this is not zero, we know that um, x1 equals zero. I could just say since u1 dotted with u1 is actually, we know, the magnitude of u1 squared is not zero. And similar arguments could be made for the rest of them. We could do the same thing. We could put a u2 here, and then the only thing that would be left, which would be the second term, so therefore x2 would be zero. And then do the same thing for u3, and so forth. So we can see that all the x's are going to be zero. Hence, this equation only has a trivial solution. Hence, s is independent. And by the way, if you have a linear independent, we know that it's a basis um, for the space spanned by those vectors. Not the whole Rn, because we might not have n of them. We only had p. The definition of this set is called an orthogonal basis. So an orthogonal basis for a subspace W of Rn is a basis for W that is also an orthogonal set. So if you get a subspace, they're linearly independent, so you have an orthogonal set. So let's look at that again. Orthogonal set. If it's orthogonal set, then it's linearly independent. Um, if we look at the span of S, not the whole thing, but the span of S is a subspace, then it's called an orthogonal basis. So I have this note. Also, um, if S is equal to U1 up to UP is an orthogonal set of unit vectors, say they're all unit vectors, then S is called an orthonormal set. And if W is a subspace spanned by such a set, then it's an orthonormal basis. The easiest example to see is the standard basis. So if we have a standard basis, is an make that a little smaller, is an orthonormal set because the value of each one of those, right, the, the length is one. And by the way, if you dot all these together, we do know that they're zero because if you the ones are all in different spots. So any e, e j, I should make these vectors. I dotted with the ej is zero as long as i is not equal to j. And I already said that the length of the minimum is one. So therefore, it's an ortho it's an orthonormal basis. Let's look at an example of this. Practice problem number one. It says let u be uh, the first vector and u2, u1 be the first vector and u2 be the second. Show that u1 comma to u2 is an orthonormal basis for R2. Since there's only two vectors, to see if it's an orthogonal set, we just got to check the two. So that's what the, the solution did first. Here's the solution. The vectors are orthogonal because u1 dot u2 happen to be zero. That's great. Then we're going to have to check to make sure they're unit vectors. So if you look at the magnitude of u1, make sure it's one, the magnitude of u2. So we take each one squared. Both of them are one. So we know that in particular this set is independent and hence is a basis for our two since there are two vectors in the set, and since it's a basis, that means it's a orthonormal basis. So therefore, the set R1 and R2 is an orthonormal basis for R2, not the span of R1 and R2, but actually the whole thing.